SoftBank has also been looking at the VR space. Earlier this month, the company led a $500 million investment in a London-based VR startup, Improbable Worlds, in one of the largest venture capital deals seen in the UK in the last decade. Now, Improbable Worlds creates virtual scenarios for gaming and massive-scale simulation. This round brings total funding for the British startup to $550 million and an at least $1 billion valuation. We caught up with Improbable CEO Herman Narula and asked asked if this funding round was the amount he was hoping for. To a lot of people, but I think what people don't see is that you know our plan is to literally build new realities, you know, massive scale simulations that you and I can you know potentially have completely new experiences inside. That is a 10-year plan, and it will take an enormous amount of technology investment and time, even beyond where we are now, to fully realize that vision. So for us, this was a logical next step in preparing the company to not only deliver for its current kind of commercial objectives, but also invest in what the technology could become in the future. Talk to us a little bit about what the technology could become in the future. It's real-world applications, it's simulation applications. Where do you think the real fruit is hanging at the moment, whether it's low or high? So people talk a lot about AI as a category. And what AI does is basically allow us to answer questions today about large sets of data that we have and find patterns in the past. What this technology represents is the ability to actually recreate reality at very large scale. So you could take a market or a city or a piece of infrastructure and actually model its behavior um, to a scale in a degree that wouldn't have been possible previously. And what we do to provide that is basically enable that massive computation to take place. So we're hoping to be a foundational technology for a lot of different applications. And um, that said, I think the potential in gaming is, is really gigantic and perhaps underappreciated. Talk to us about the gaming application because so, you've actually got a new application out at the moment. Yes, it's trending yeah. on Twitch. Tell us yeah. all about it. So Worlds Adrift is the, is the game in question. So the, the applications in gaming are really about going from single experiences where people are being separated into small groups of players on replica servers or playing in very static worlds to really creating massive shareable experiences with millions of simulated entities inside them. And that's just a huge sea change in the experience. All of a sudden, you're not playing to a script. You're able to have experience that are being defined by you and your friends in a really fundamental way. And Worlds Adrift is one of the first virtual worlds to have um, a massive, gigantic world with everyone in the same world. Um, and also it has the ability to have physics in great detail on the back end, which hasn't been possible previously. So all of these trends are just going to lead to deep engagement in games. I'm thinking of mass market people, am amount of people able to game all at the same time yes. in the same virtual world. What does that mean money-wise? How do you monetize these sorts well, of games? Well, it's a really good question. So monetization tends to be proportional to engagement, the degree to which someone cares about the world, wants to be in the world. This technology makes those worlds even more compelling and engaging. So people want to be in them longer, see them as being a more valuable investment in their time and money, and ultimately it creates more different, you know, more opportunities for monetization, um, particularly if you have huge social groups all participating at the same time. It creates competitive behavior, which creates even more monetization potential. So the monetization that you have envisaged, is it the freemium model where it's free to play, but then you're buying certain things within the virtual reality? real world or yeah I think people are going to invest a lot more in the things they purchase within these virtual worlds because they become more engaging so property in virtual worlds items all manner of things suddenly become an enormous sink in in, in people's time investment and interest so that's the gaming element and the fact that you think that that is potentially un really not understood quite yet as to the sheer scale this could become. But the real world applications you mentioned, I'm thinking smarter cities, I'm thinking uh, what other applications? I mean, it's, it's really about better decisions. So many of the large projects, choices, policies, interventions that are done in the world are based on effectively static models of how the world works. Mm -hmm. If we could build massive simulations that actually recreate these systems in their entirety, then seeing how, say, a power failure might affect a city in a cascading way, or how a terrorist attack could be ameliorated through better um, development of infrastructure, all become feasible possibilities for the future. Our government's talking to you, particularly after Manchester, we think of this week, the terrorist attacks. Well, we're very fortunate that we've had a lot of support from the British government, and we've done uh, work with government on infrastructure simulation, which is um, beginning to bear some fruit. So SoftBank comes in and gives you half a billion. What do they want to see out of this in particular? So I think, you know, not wanting to kind of put words in Masayoshi's, uh, Masayoshi-san's head, but um, 
the interactions that I have had show me that they're interested in a very long-term technical vision. I think they believe, as we do, that virtual worlds are going to become a fundamental change in the way that we live, work, and play, and the way that we kind of run our society. So I think for them, much like us, it's about a long-term investment in the future. And it was interesting because we had a, quite a competitive sort of round process. And I think what won us over to working with SoftBank was not just their vision, but also the sheer scale of their operations and the potential synergies that we see between other things that they're doing. I asked you at the beginning whether you wanted that amount of money, and you say certainly you can put it to work. But SoftBank has a reputation, perhaps, giving startups more money than they ask for. Is that the case with you? And, and is there so, any negative? So I think that's a fair um, worry, I think, for the scene in general, the idea of you know, too much money going into companies at the wrong stage. I think in our specific case, we were looking to raise on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. So it was within the context of what we were looking to raise and to do. And we had a relatively competitive process. We're also fortunate that you know, we have investors like Andreessen Horowitz and you know, Horizon Ventures and Selena Chow, who've become amazing advisors to us. So for us, we have the, the benefit of being able to consider these options in the context of very experienced partners who've helped us to see why this is the right move. Would it delay any IPO process? What is your view on I, Well, that? I think certainly this kind of private capital does mean that you can think differently about approaching the public markets. And, and you know, for us, with a long-term technology play, yes, that is an interesting, um, I think, probable uh, cause of that, and it will take us longer before we, we feel it's time to do that. But I think, in general, it doesn't have to be um, something that prevents companies from going public, because fundamentally, like getting liquidity for early employees, being put into a position where you can access even more capital, I, I think there's still an attraction to, to floating. Um, and perhaps one day when we reach that stage, we will look to do that too.